Hello, this is Julia Gamelina of Madam Architect, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw mine modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. And this just in, U.S. Modernist (laughs) Radio is now the number three arts and design podcast in Singapore. Yay! Hello, South Asia. (laughs) You all remember the 1994 movie Speed, the huge hit with the runaway L.A. bus that put Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock on the map as major stars? Ten years later, with the public clamoring for more Keanu and Sandra, they shot another movie, but got completely upstaged by a co-star. The Lake House was a romantic fantasy film about a magic, time-traveling mailbox for a particularly beautiful modernist house. Joining us today are the architect and engineer for that house, production designer Nathan Crowley, and engineer Fritz Henge, as we celebrate the 15th anniversary of the birth and death of one of the movie's most amazing houses. Joining us later from Nashville, special musical guest Heather Rigdon. And now, if I can get him to stop smiling, must be that (laughs) Singapore news, here's your host, George Smart. Well, hi, folks. I mean, I'm happy about our Singapore audience, but I'm really happy because we've got such a good show today. The guys behind the lake house and one of my very favorite singers, Heather Rigdon, who you'll be looking up on Pandora very soon. Let's start with speed. 1994. Such a good movie. Hard to believe it was out over 25 years ago. We all love the pairing of Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock, because otherwise we would have seen Stephen Baldwin and Ellen DeGeneres, who were first considered for the roles. Really? I am not making that up. Ooh. They would have been awful. The always delirious Dennis Hopper of Easy Rider and Blue Velvet fame puts a bomb on Sandra's public bus set to blow up when the bus stops. Cop Keanu is called in and boards while the bus is moving, and while Keanu tries to locate and defuse the bomb, Sandra drives it all around L.A., including a dramatic and physically impossible bus jump. Hundreds of armchair Einsteins quickly determine that a bus traveling at only 69 miles an hour would go straight down into flames. Yeah. But that didn't stop fans from around the world from loving the scene. The movie was a huge hit, and immediately there were calls for a sequel. And the bad news is, there was a sequel. (laughs) Speed 2, with Sandra minus Keanu, involving a cruise ship headed to blow up an oil tanker. stupid. So stupid. Yeah. Getting Keanu and Sandra together didn't happen until the lake house, which cost a fourth as much as Speed 2 and made $75 million. (laughs) Nice. We'll talk with production designer Nathan Crawley and engineer Fritz Henge to celebrate the 15th anniversary of the birth and death of one of the movie's most amazing houses. Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from Modernist Realtor Angela Roll and Nichiha.com slash U.S. Modernist. See. Eight. 
much. Let's get to it. Here's the plot of The Lake House, fresh off of Wikipedia. Sandra Bullock's character, Kate, leaves a lake house she has been renting in Kenosha, Wisconsin, to move to Chicago. She leaves a note in the mailbox for the next tenant to forward her mail. Two years earlier, in 2004, Keanu Reeves as Alex, an architect, arrives at the lake house designed by his architect father, played by Christopher Plummer. He finds Kate's 2006 letter in the mailbox. Already. Already. Hmm. Alex and Kate continue passing messages to each other via the magic mailbox and discover they are living exactly two years apart. When I saw this movie for the first time, which was even before starting U.S. Modernist, I knew this was an incredible work of architecture and engineering, and I'm thrilled to have the architect and engineer with us today. Production designer Nathan Crowley, born in London, has a degree in art, worked for several architects, and later shifted into film. That was a good call, because now he's one of the most sought-after production and experienced designers in the world, in not only movies like Braveheart, Interstellar, and First Man, but also TV series such as Star Trek and Worst, Wor Worst World. And <laughs> I really like Westworld. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I prefer Westworld. <laughs> <laughs> TV series such as Star Trek and Westworld, and commercial products for Captain Morgan's, Amazon, Lady Gaga, the Museum of Modern Art, and Prada. He's a regular part of the Impossible to Get Tickets for Met Gala in New York every year. He's been Oscar nominated five times for production design and art direction. And near and dear to us, he's been a juror for the George Matsumoto Prize, North Carolina's highest honor exclusively for modernist houses. Welcome, Nathan. Thanks very much. That's a very sweet opening. Fritz Hingi is wanted by the FBI in 18 states. No, wait, wait. No, Fritz <laughs> is a registered architect in 18 states, a professional engineer in Wisconsin, a registered structural engineer in Illinois, and he still owes Blockbuster $14 in late fees from the 90s. <laughs> For Burns and McDonald, he leads manufacturing and industrial, pharmaceutical, institutional, commercial and food, beverage, and consumer products projects. Fritz has a degree in architecture from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Go Flames! A master's yeah. degree in project management from Northwestern University. Go Wildcats! And a master's degree in structural engineering from the Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, go Mies, right? <laughs> Welcome, Fritz. Thank you. So, Nathan... Before we get started in the lake house, you designed not only one of the, the best houses in cinema, the lake house, but also one of the all-time coolest vehicles in movie history, the Tumbler. Tell us about the Tumbler. Well, I, uh, the Tumbler, actually, I designed that just prior to the lake house, so they're very related. In, well, they're unrelated, but literally got off Batman Begins having shot in Chicago and I it was my first time to Chicago and I remember thinking this is a great place and then I was swiftly off offered the lake house but the tumbler was really uh, you know our first sort of journey into vehicle design and uh, myself and Chris Nolan were like we have to design a, a sort of modern Batmobile that relates to the present and obviously the present at that time was about sort of urban vehicles I've always been a big fan of angular car design, like going back to like the Quattro and going back to, uh, you know, the Citroen. Um, my favorite car is the 71 Citroen Maserati. It doesn't work, but I've always liked... <laughs> Minor detail. I always mix. <laughs> so it was like, let's mix a mid-engine sports car with a tank. So uh, <laughs> that was the design brief. <laughs> So, uh, and we came up with the tumbler and it drives and we got it up to a hundred miles per hour at one point. And then we did drive it all around the loop. We shot all the way around the loop in Chicago and we, we have these giant handbrakes in it so we could, uh, pull them and corner it. You could take a 90 degree turn. Interestingly, because it's a two and a half ton car. I was going to ask how big it was. Wow. 
Yeah, two and a half times, and it's got like a, a big block Chevy engine. Uh, it's right behind where you drive, so you, it's incredibly hot. <laughs> I mean, it's not, I mean, it really is a little badly designed car, but it looks cool. So, I mean, it goes. I mean, it really, when you see it jump through that waterfall in Batman Begins, that's a real car coming, jumping at you. It's no CGI, but that was so much fun. And then, of course, we ended up, uh, well, that was my introduction to Chicago, which is like this town is, look, I mean, it looks fantastic. It's like, Everything I like about modernism is there. <laughs> yeah, it's a great architecture Sorry. city. Nathan, how many tumblers did you build, and are there any still around that people can go visit? Yeah, they're, like, they're at the Warner Museum. I mean, I, there were we built ones because every time we jump it into that cave, we'd have to do a run-up down the uh, studio lot and then into the cave. <laughs> um, we probably built about nine to do different things. Some of them had to flip and, uh, you know, there's about probably two or three left because then we did the Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises, so we, pro- we progressively destroyed them. <laughs> but yeah, no, they're still there. Yeah, no, I haven't been inside one since just before the lake house. I drove one around when we were testing them, and it was extremely good fun. <laughs> but hot. <laughs> Very hot. There's a, you know, it's just, there's no visibility either. You can't, the windows are so little. You, <laughs> we actually put little uh, cameras everywhere so you could actually see where you're going. Cause you need a periscope. Oh but my. I guess that's the tank of it. Yeah, yeah that's how um, tanks got around, right? Yeah, and, you know, if you hit something, you okay, providing it wasn't a person. <laughs> I learned about this, Nathan, because the tumbler is characterized by those giant wheels that are in front of it. And it was featured on yeah. a recent Batmobile documentary that you were in. That's right. I was in that documentary. I've only seen parts of that. I guess, you know, I'm desperate. I should watch stuff, but... uh they were odd tire. We needed a certain size, and we had no front axle. So they were like for beach buggies or some kind of off-road vehicle, uh, those tires. And, um, I mean, really, I guess the tumblers like the <laughs> Citroen Maserati, definitely super unreliable <laughs> in the long term. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks great parked and moving. Yeah. But uh, great fun. I mean... You just, I mean, I guess it's like architecture. you just got to take the risk. It's like, I like it. If I don't like it, then I'll become an angry man in the corner. <laughs> yeah. You can't have that. <laughs> now, Fritz, you're not in the movie business, so how did you get connected to the Lake House production? So I was working for an engineering firm in Chicago, and we were working with the Forest Preserve to design a fishing pier that was supposed to go in the location of that, where the Lake House was going to go. And... We were going through the permitting process and had, were waiting for six months to get the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to return our phone calls to give us approval to proceed with the construction of that fishing pier. And right in the middle of that waiting, we got contacted by, I think, Warner Brothers that they were interested in talking to us about our project location and possibly get involved in designing a lake house for a movie. So... I think since our company had the relationship with the Forest Preserve and we had knowledge of the site, I guess we were asked first if we wanted to get involved. And we had about, I don't know, 20 minutes to decide if we wanted to get involved or not. Um, Because I think Warner Brothers had a couple of other people lined up after us that they were going to see. It went went really, really quick. They called us, I think, like half an hour beforehand, and then they just showed up at our office. Before they left, they wanted an answer. So it was... (laughs) <laughs> that sounds about right for the film industry. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, there's never any time. Uh, and I, uh, you know, it's just about, I, I think it's mainly driven by release schedules and actor schedules. But we're um, desperately in the rush. And I know the real world, as I would call you for it, are always astonished by, like, who are these nutballs coming in here? <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, but you know, on the, on the flip side, it was interesting because. While we were waiting for six months for them to return our call just on a small little fishing pier, I think we got our permit for this one from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in like four hours. Oh. The film industry has a way to speed things up. And where was the lake portrayed in the lake house? Oh, I mean, we don't really identify. I don't think we ever named the lake. I mean, it's Maple Lake in Illinois, but um, I don't think we ever identify the lake as Maple Lake or as any place. We, it's always just referred to as the lake house. I mean, mm-hmm. We're going back 15 years. I'd have to analyze the script, but I don't think we ever say where it is. Okay. Um, 
uh, we, I mean, really, we needed an empty lake. I mean, just as Warner Brothers rush into Fritz's office, they also come to me and says, of course you can find a lake house on an empty lake in Illinois. <laughs> you know, so, uh, okay. you know, and of course you can find a modernist lake house. It was like... And Fritz, you were being asked to build a fishing pier on this lake? Yeah, so we had we had designed a fishing pier for the County Forest Preserve, and it was part of a shoreline restoration project that we were working on with them. Yeah, construction documents were done. We had received a permit from the county and was waiting for a U.S. Army Corps of Engineer permit. And contractors on board, they were ready to break ground and get going on it. Nathan, describe for us what the house was like. What was it made of, and, and how did it hold together? I guess... Um, you know, Chicago, I love the history of Chicago. I specifically like the White City. I, I love those exhibitions of, of, of that era, you know, especially like the Crystal Palace uh, that was south in Hyde Park and then eventually moved to Crystal Palace. You know, I love that era, but I also grew up uh, with a our father's architect. We grew up in a glass house, <laughs> not a lake house, but a glass box. So I love the modernism, but I love the romanticism of that era, the glass house era with its decoration. And so when you're a film designer, it's not about, you also have to design for the story. You have to engage in that narrative. And the narrative was this big romance. So I felt that I would dangerously do architects who, I have many friends who are architects who were very upset, mix 60s modernism with period glass house. Uh, and I would often say to them, look, I need to put romanticism because it's a bit too quick view. It's too um, brutalist. Uh, and they would say, no, there's romanticism in glass houses. So anyway, I did it. Uh, you know, that was my my thing was I, I also I love like those glass houses, those details and like the Grand Palais in Paris. It's like, I mean, it's just this sort of, it has this sort of age. And I knew I wanted to put a house on still in the lake and we knew through the location manager James McAllis I don't know if you remember him Fritz and Troy Osman the construction manager we knew that you were building piers in there so we were thinking well you know maybe we put this thing on still and that allowed us part of the story is Alex or Keanu builds a pier he always says oh they should, you should be able to touch the water so it allowed us to add we, we had script stuff that we needed to include in it Plus, I mean, it's crazy things in film like the, the camera angle of the, the mailbox to the house has to be right. You know, there's lots of these things that you have to take into consideration. But anyway, the house design was a sort of mix of turn of the century exhibition glass houses, uh, the 19th century, I should say, with modernist glass house. So it was really a mix about, I guess it was nostalgia, that you felt some nostalgia for that wasn't too brutalist. Because then you kind of sympathize with Alex, you know, remembering his mother in this place. Now, Fritz, who built the house and how long did it take to construct? Um, the gentleman by the name of Troy, Troy, Troy Osborne, I believe. Osborne, yeah. So we worked closely with him. We had about two weeks. So we got the sketch of it. We got a 3D sketch of what it was, what it was going to look like. And then we got a rudimentary plan with some basic dimensions on it. And we had about two weeks to do the structural design. Then Troy wanted to go out for bids to three different steel contractors. And then we had to get a permit from the county. So we had about a total of three, four weeks to design it. And then Troy, I think, built the whole thing in seven, eight weeks. Wow, that's fast. That's, that's yeah. fast. Yeah. So we started in January, and then I think by early February is when we issued for fabrication, steel fabrication, and then I think they moved in early April. So we, we worked with Troy to identify, like, the steel frame. He insisted there wouldn't be any on-site welding, so it's all bolted connections. He told us that Nathan didn't want any diagonal bracing, so we had to do kind of moment connections to keep the building from swaying too much in the wind. And so we worked with steel fabricators to identify what kind of steel members and columns they have readily available. Otherwise, you know, you run into lead time issues. Now, I couldn't tell this from the movie, and I know it was just a house built for a film, but was there a bathroom in it? (laughs) (laughs) 
Absolutely no. not. <laughs> Agnes don't need to go to the bathroom. So uh, <laughs> that's brilliant. I mean, it's weird. We had to consider. Really, we it's always about air conditioning and heating because we had to plug in some of those things. And really, because it was over the water, often we build exterior sets and you run a you know air, AC hose in and then you pull it out for the camera, and then the toilet, the porta lose in in the lot you know that's um right but this house is over water so it was, we were building it you know we were going to shoot in spring and you know what chicago's like or illinois is like it's not friendly in winter and then then it gets very hot in summer so it was like we, we needed both so we definitely plugged some in because we just couldn't get the hoses in and it was glass you know <laughs> so, very unpractical house i would say wouldn't you agree yes. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out where that attic is that's, that's in the movie. Yeah, the secret attic was like I refused yeah. to put an attic in, and it was like I think in post production they maybe build an attic in, in the studio lot. It's like oh, that house doesn't have an attic. Like put his box in the cupboard, but the writer was insistent, or the director, I don't know who, and it was like, well, where does an attic go here? It was like it's a flat roof with a glass canopy that opens for a tree. It's very funny. Like, I, I get a lot of stick over that attic, but I have no, you know, like, it shouldn't exist. But the house stood well. I mean, it had a lot of crew on it. So Fritz and his team, I mean, you know, you have, sometimes you have like 30, 40 people in there, you know, wow. constantly. So We're going to hear more about what happened to the house in just a minute. But first, a word from our adventurous realtor, Angela Rowe. In her continuing fantasy life, modernist realtor Angela Roll was hired to work for Britain's MI6, not as a spy, but to build a secret tunnel so the Prime Minister and Hugh Grant could enter and exit the building without anyone knowing. Maybe they're going up to the attic, who knows? Yes. In appreciation, she was invited to four royal weddings and a funeral. But after accidentally spilling a bottle of Chateau Margaux 1787 on someone's mother, who had a crown, she was burned notice to Prague in the Czech Republic. Angela was broke with only a 9mm Ruger, a circular saw, and a red ball gown. She studied architecture by day and built portable dance floors by night. It was on one of her dance floors at the Finnish Embassy that she waltzed into the arms of international man of mystery, Eric of Helsinki, whom she later married. On their honeymoon aboard the Queen Mary II, she narrowly got her circular saw past customs in New York via her cloak of invisibility because all heroines have one, to become a formidable real estate agent with architecture training, deftly dealing with unreasonable sellers, unrealistic buyers, incompetent builders, slow bureaucrats, while unlocking the superpower of modernism the world has yet to fully appreciate. Modernist realtor Angela Roll is your special agent. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L or 919 995 Zero five five zero. Thank you, Tom. Nathan, I understand that you spent your entire budget pretty much for the movie on the house with the rest of the movie in existing locations. What got to be so expensive yeah. about the lake house? Well, I, we uh, well we had no time to build it, and you know we end up paying the amount of labor. I mean. Usually in film, you, you kind of spread it out over a series of sets, but uh, when we couldn't find a late house to suit, and I knew going there, we would not find it, and we would have to build it. You know, we were on a relatively medium-budget film. We didn't have endless resources, so, I, I you know, you get given a slice of the pie, and, I, you know, I think I got, for my construction budget, was like $1.1 million for the entire film, which might sort of sound like a lot, but if you're going to 40, 50 locations, you divide that doesn't add up to a lot so then i knew that i had to build the lake house and with the, troy the construction manager is like okay we have to go and see the studio and just tell him like i'm going to spend nine hundred thousand on the lake house and they were not happy with that and i said well then you need to rename your your movie <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> the <trapped house. laughs> we got to build it and it's got to be that and I said I can do it because we're in Chicago we have such brilliant locations in Chicago brilliant and there's so much to choose from uh, all over the place like LaSalle Street alone has interiors and, and Chicago is one of the most welcoming film cities in the world you know, I knew I could do it I just had to convince Warner Brothers and really it was expensive because we had to work 
Chris was doing the steel stuff. We were having that made. We were prefabbing all the windows and everything in like machine shops, working long hours, and that's a lot of labor. We had to get lots and lots of teams building all the parts and build it like a Lego set at the end. It all had to come together. And so that gets very expensive when you look at the labor costs of something like that. So, yeah, it was just a hurry. I mean, to build that house in seven or eight weeks, it was, you know, it's like all these things. I didn't think we'd make it. Um, We didn't seem to have any hiccups. You know, you expect something to not show up like the glass, (laughs) you know? (laughs) (laughs) Well, as a production designer, do you find yourself resenting people who rely on CGI? Uh, Not really, because it's it's weird. It's like we don't, we make films practically, and we may, Mm. and, and I love practical filmmaking, because it's so much more fun. Yeah. If you're going to sit in a sound stage with green screen, I don't want to do that. It's like I didn't want to work for commercial architects in the city of London doing their canteens. You know, <laughs> I, don't, I just get bored and then I'm useless. So to go outside and attempt to build a lake house and achieve something makes me feel great. And, uh, you know, and I like the adventure of it and trying to get it done and, you know, at the end of the day, we're making a film, you know, we're not saving lives. So if we have to delay a week, you know, sorry. But I think practical filmmaking is just more interesting and old techniques. I mean, we still use a lot of miniatures. It's it's odd because nowadays I've become one of the few designers who still knows how to do practical techniques because everyone else has retired Mm -hmm. who taught me them. I find myself more in demand now because... We build miniatures and paint backing and do false perspectives. And, and really, it was it's because when I was young, in my 20s, these guys would teach us this stuff, and it was phenomenal, you know? The other thing is you get weather, and if you go outside, and I remember on Dark Night, we, we had to film on the Sears Tower, I don't know what it's called now, on the 90th floor or the 80th floor, and put Christian Bell out there, and it was a storm brewing and the helicopter pilot had a camera, and he was trying to get him standing on the Sears Tower, and we had, a, like, a rope tied to his foot or a piece of cable to tie him off to make sure, you know, he'd be safe to some degree, I guess. And we were all up there, and it was like... And the cameraman said, I can't see a thing, and it's just like, just roll camera, you know, let's see what it looks like. I think it's one of the best shots in the film. CG can't predict that. They say they can, but I think you get some emotion from real things that you can touch and the audience feels it. Like people felt that house was real. It wasn't a door with an extension. You know what I mean? So, and I think that's really important for audiences. And our job as designers is to make the audience just accept that exists without question and, you know, almost to go unnoticed. Um, And when you do CG and the camera's in an impossible place, I just, Feels like a video game to me. Sorry, all you CG lovers. <laughs> I was one of the people among many who did fall in love with the house. And I heard that after production, Sandra Bullock fell in love with it and wanted to buy it. Is that right, Fritz? You know, to be honest, after it was built, I had never saw it again. And I asked what happened to it, and he wouldn't tell me. Well, they took it apart. It's gone. Oh, really? I yeah, it's gone. it was disassembled. Gone, yeah. But I'm wondering if anybody knows, like, what happened to it? Did they just throw the Stiegel away, or did somebody rebuild it somewhere? Well, there was an idea to rebuild it. Um, Troy, the uh, the construction contractor, took it apart. Obviously, he couldn't save the glass, but he took the frame, still frame, and the parts apart and flat packed it with the hope that someone might fund building it somewhere. But that, you know. I think people move on. I think the studio moved on, uh, you know, and, and it just, I think it was probably put in storage somewhere. It, you know, there's these vast um, warehouses full of set pieces that are, are stored because in case someone wants to go back and pick up a shot after they edit it. So there's, it really is the Indiana warehouses. <laughs> you know, you can find submarines in there. <laughs> so, uh, I think it ended up in there. A great shame. Is this like the Ark of the Covenant where we have to find it in a government warehouse somewhere? Oh, yeah, there's lots of those. (laughs) Yeah. Of course, the resale value of a glass house with no bathroom might be limited. Hmm. But it's got a hole in the middle where the tree is. (laughs) Oh, which could be repurposed. 
after the movie aired and, and over the years since, have people reached out to you besides us about the lake house? A few people. I mean, I think people just sort of comment on it, just sort of, they really like the house. I mean, I get these odd posts saying, what happened to the house? Or do you have any of the original sketches? And I took a bunch of photos because I gave my father who hung it proudly, finally, his son, and made a glass house, although he didn't agree with the detailing. So, uh, <laughs> uh, There's parents for you. <laughs> was your father an architect, Nathan? He was, yeah. He was uh, a, a true, and he, was, he worked on, uh, as a young man, he worked on the Barbican in London, and then he built that. He had the house built we grew up in, which was a glass house. You know, I grew up with a uh, breeze block or concrete block walls and glass. It was... He was verging on brutalist, I think. So, mm. um, this movie is really about you because one of the main plots yeah. in the movie is a relationship between Alex and his father, who is also an architect. Well, that's why I kind of took the film. It was like, oh, this is familiar. My dad would be like, I don't, you know, he'd be sitting on his drawing board with his felt tip pens. And he says, I don't make, I said, hey, what happens if you make a mistake? He says, I don't make a mistake. Uh, you know, we we definitely, he was the, the architect. No, it was very much like, oh, Jesus, this story is like, this is my dad, you know? Wow. <laughs> he was a firm believer. He was definitely the O'Rourke, and um, he lived by his principles. Like, in fact, we even lived in the Barbican for a while uh, when it wasn't popular. In fact, we just finished that film, Tenant, and we got to film in the Liner Hall, which is the Soviet 1980 arena which is a piece of, it's like the Barbican on steroids. And I was... Oh, wow. I finally, I finally put that modernist brutalism thing in my head that had been drilled in all my life to bed. It's like, okay, this is it. We've got a 5,000 brutalist arena called the Liner Hall in Tallinn. And it's finally like, oh, yeah, there you go. That is the pinnacle. I remember standing with Chris Nolan going, okay, I think we've done this period of architecture. <laughs> <laughs> now, Fritz, was the Lake House your only single-family residential project? Because you tend to do much bigger projects. It, well, as much as it is a single-family home. I did do some renovation projects for single-family homes um, in the suburbs, but nothing that would, that would come anywhere near aspiring to design excellence or anything beyond useful, um, practical additions. No, my, my background is mostly in industrial and, and public, more engineering type projects. I was wondering if there were any secret lake houses that we should find out about of yours, Fritz, that are you know hanging around <laughs> no. the Midwest. <laughs> you mean duplicate the design and adapt it to a useful uh, single-family house? Right. Yeah, with a bathroom, yeah. Uh, right, and build it in seven <laughs> weeks. <laughs> <The> bathroom. <laughs> Did that fishing pier ever get built? It did get built, yes. The permitting process through the Army Corps of Engineers went a lot faster after the Warner Brothers kind of set the, set the tone by moving, I don't know how many thousands of cubic feet of dirt. Nathan, yeah. um, I have one last question for you. I have heard for years that Sofia Coppola is a modernist fan. Do you know you worked with her recently on La Traviata? Uh, yeah, God, have we had that conversation? We tried to work on, on a few films, and I believe she is, I don't know, uh, yes, and I think she has appreciation of it. We've never discussed that, but it's definitely, it's not like her taste would not necessarily align with mine, but we find common ground. So I can't, I don't know if I can answer that, but I suspect she probably is, um, because she certainly likes the furniture. I know that for sure. Well, if you chat with her, please let her know that we'd love to have her on the show to talk about it. Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, listen, I, we're in a time at the moment, a dreadful time where everyone's available to do things. That is true. So, uh, yeah. well, I mean, the film industry is definitely on hold, and uh, so we, we get to catch up on all the things we promise and never show up for. <laughs> so... Yeah, my wife and I are busy binging all these TV shows at home, and it suddenly hit us that in the fall, <laughs> will there be anything to watch? Because at some point, the stuff that was done before March is going to run out, right? It, it will do, yeah. I, I think, um, I mean, I would suggest going back to Turner Movie Classics, 
Oh yeah. I'm I'm already there. I'm already on Turning Point the Classics and pick a director and watch all that pick like Billy Wilder, watch all his films and it's just like there's some in there that I've never seen and it's like I mean I, we, I guess we've all slowed down a bit, haven't we? Um We have. Which is which is kind of nice. Um I mean it's awful what's happening, but we ha it does make me slow down and stop and definitely reevaluate what we're up to. Fritz Nathan, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I've been wanting to talk with you guys since I saw the movie 15 years ago. And it's great to get some of the backstory about how it came together and what happened to it and your thoughts about it as we came along. Thank you so much for coming on. God, pleasure. Well, thank you for having us. What finally happened at the lake house? I spoke with Troy Osmond, who built it. Sadly, the house is not in a secret warehouse somewhere. It was sent to scrap. The expediency required at the end of the film to restore the area to original condition meant no time to arrange the subsequent location. Osmond saved a few beams for a few years, but then had to get rid of those too. Like all of us, he would love to see the house rebuilt one day. You're working along at your desk or driving in your car listening to music. These days, you're likely listening to a streaming service like iTunes or Stitcher or Pandora. Four years ago, I was at my desk writing up one of these podcasts, and I created a Diana Krall channel on Pandora on my iPhone. Diana Krall burst in the scene in the mid-90s and is one of the world's foremost jazz singers, up there with Michael Buble and, yes, even Ella Fitzgerald. Pandora channels work like a bot-run DJ or an Amazon recommendation. You know, if you bought X, then you'll love Y. Channels always start with the person you've picked, then go to play similar artists you are likely going to like. About five songs into the feed on a hot, muggy Tuesday night, I heard an entrancing voice, so clear, so beautiful, that the air suddenly became fresh and cool. The room brightened. A unicorn passed by my window. <laughs> and I spent the next four minutes going... Damn. That voice was Heather Rigdon, a jazz and contemporary <laughs> singer you should know more about. Like a show on TLC, she was born to a Pentecostal family with three sisters and kept from popular music, except for maybe a little Ray Charles, until her teens. She didn't record her first album, Young and Naive, until 2007 in her 30s. The song choices in the album are anything but Young and Naive. They share a common point of view, a breathlessly smart, beautiful, independent woman who is in no hurry for commitment and is having a great time until some lucky guy comes along. Young and Naive was produced with a simple trio of piano, bass, and drums, bringing Heather's intimate, soulful vocals to shine. Some of her songs from the album are in films and TV. Table for Two is featured in Trust the Man, starring Julianne Moore and David Duchovny, and also the new Fox drama, Whitaker Bay. Hi, Heather. Hello. Wow. Thank you for that intro. George, are you the lucky guy? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Heather, I assume growing up as a Pentecostal, you didn't live in a modernist house. Is that right? Well, actually, we lived in a more of a traditional you know, just, just it was, we lived in the parsonage, you know, for the majority of my upraising in Plano, Texas. Yeah, it wasn't and, a modernist. Um, you know, some of the things like functionality and, um, you know, sparse decor, things like that, you know, were very, those kinds of things could be similar, you know. But you live in a more modern house now. Oh, definitely. Yes. You know, very, very humble, but it's, uh, it's, it's really great. It's a re- Basically, some millennial couple had redone the entire house and um, left behind a sea urchin lamp fixture for me, which I <laughs> adore. And it's in our big open bay window, you know, where you can see the urchin light from the street and the perfect family having dinner. Everybody's coming home after the rush. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and you're not in Plano anymore, are you? We are now um, hailing from Hendersonville, Tennessee just about 18 miles northeast of Nashville. But the style, you know, when they knocked out the wall in the front, they really opened up the whole big area. So my three-year-old and my five-year-old basically have a heyday. You know, they have their 
their uh, scooters inside and their rollerblades. And on rainy days and COVID, they um, find enough time to be in and out, but definitely enjoy going down the long haul. That Ray Charles tape, Heather, that your dad had, was that something that was contraband for the church or was Ray Charles an approved performer? (laughs) Well, my, my dad has always been, you know, pushing the edge a little. He had the benefit of traveling quite a lot, you know, in his, he and my mom in the early days. To, I mean, he met Mother Teresa. He was head of the youth missions division, so they traveled all over the world. So he had a broader scope, and he always loved Ray Charles and because you know, he was from uh, Louisiana. It was an eight-track, actually, and it was in his drawer. You know, for them, it was secular music. It was definitely something that would have been, I wouldn't say frowned upon, but it wasn't necessarily what was normally accepted. It wasn't in the canon of approved tunes. Yes. <laughs> no, that's true. Well, you know, I mean, he was kind of a wild man, you know. I understand that your first you know, big-time popular concert was U2. That must have been amazing. Oh, my Lord, it was amazing. It was Dallas. They did Bullet the Blue Sky and cast these huge searchlights into the sky, and it, it made it look like we were standing in a cathedral. And it was, it was just fantastic. It blew, it blew my mind. I was 24 years old. When I was in middle school, I had a, a buddy who would burn me. Well, not burn me because it wasn't CDs, but it was mixtapes, mm-hmm. you know, and so they would burn me a few things here and there. So some of my secular exposure was really, really random and all over the place. But um, I think one thing that kind of set me apart when I came to town here and was singing my own demos was I hadn't been listening heavily to Mariah Carey or Whitney Houston, or I wasn't really influenced by some of the current voices because I really didn't have, you know, hadn't had a whole lot of access to them because the main things I was influenced were Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, you know, or, you know, Greta Garbo or, you know, anything from the silver screen or, you know, singing in the rain. Like there was so much of a, you know, an older sound, I guess. So that's, I think that's really what started perking up some of the ears of the producers here was that it just didn't sound like everybody else. What led you to this jazz area that you're so great at? I'd always loved jazz. I'd always, you know, listened. Ella Fitzgerald, of course, was wonderful. And Peggy Lee were two influencers for sure. But I really fell into the jazz thing when when I was new to Nashville in 2000. A girlfriend of mine had invited me to a dinner. And it was more often times than not, you'd go to a dinner and a concert would break out because, it, you know, after dinner, everybody just starts picking up an instrument and you would go around the circle. It was kind of like the, you know, riders in the round that they do at Bluebird. Well, you would do that in people's homes. And so people would be showcasing something new they were working on, or if somebody was a singer, they they just brought a song, maybe they'd want to sing. And I actually met Clifford during one of those times. He's your producer. He is my producer. And um, he is the genius behind the music that you hear. And when he heard my voice, he began to, you know, put my voice in that format. And, it re- you know, it was really interesting for me for a while because I used to tell, like, I felt like I was borrowing this really expensive, really luxurious dress. Like, I was like, <laughs> wow, like, this is, this is really fantastic, you know, and I want to take this dress out and I want to take it for a dance and a, and a, you know, drive or something. And at the time, I was a little intimidated. The one, one of the reasons why I think it took seven years for the first one is I was really intimidated by the genre mainly because there's so many fast, just fantastic players. And there's the, you know, sometimes the feeling that when it's, you're the voice, that somehow maybe that's a little, and this is my feeling, was that here I was surrounded by these fantastic musicians and, you know, they could talk all these songs and they could talk all these different parts and the reason why they're cool, you know, it's augmented fifth over a, you know, diamond seven or, huh. <laughs> and I'm totally messing that up, I'm sure. But, you know, it was really a little intimidating at first, but I don't know if it was maybe all the time, like in uh, gospel choir, because uh, jazz and gospel, you know, they're rooted together down there, way, way deep down under the tree. And that was one thing that Clifford said, he, you, he said you really don't have to sing it. You just, you just have to tell the story. And so we began doing that. My biggest draw with Cliff at the beginning was I was getting the chance to write. And I was hoping to further my talent and learn the craft as a, as a writer. Working with Clifford, we, I was able to do some of that. From her album, Young and Naive, the song I first heard four years ago on a hot, muggy Tuesday night. 
bad for business. Soft touch, sweet smile Maybe I could stay a while I ought to be wild and free But something you're selling's got a hold on me One woman, more than one man Your basic law of supply and demand I've done the math and babe, the truth is You're bad for business You're bad for business What's a girl to do? My five-year plan says to drop the man But I can't follow through A single girl, a world of time Settling down would be a crime Eyes blue eyes and red hot kisses Baby, you're bad for business You're bad for business I can't get you off of my mind Instead of playing the field and the art of the deal You're taking up all of my time Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose But sometimes a loss is a gain So steal a kiss, make me sigh The benefits are pretty high The bottom line comes down to this You're bad for business The bottom line comes down to this You're bad for business It's amazing how outside my window, there's another unicorn. How does that happen? (laughs) I was watching George while I was listening to that. He was dancing in his chair. It was funny. Oh, how nice. I wish I could have seen that. We should have zoomed that straight in. Yeah, right. We should have zoomed that. (laughs) You know, I was thinking about like, you know, Bad for Business. That whole, you know, first album was really kind of like a diary of just ideas about love and things that I was experiencing and, you know, how... The idealism kind of meets up with the day-to-day. You know, when I first came to Nashville, I was, you know, just kind of dating around and trying to find out a little bit of more of who I was and, you know, put some pieces together. It was very interesting to me. The first album was over seven years, and the second album was also another seven. And um, Bad for Business was something I did with Clifford and Christy Jackson. And, you know, we really loved that vibe. And that's kind of what I was... It was kind of my way to send out my ambassador when I was dating. I never had to get very close to anyone. And later on, when we listened to the other song, if you you juxtapose them together, it's very interesting because if you listen to the vocal, the vocal is a very different feel. And um, To Have and To Hold was one that I recorded a little later in those seven years. And I was a little wiser. And I met someone that I was really willing to 
work on. You know, it's no longer all their problem and what they're bringing the re- to the relationship. You start looking at when it's someone you want to have and to hold, you know, you really start looking at what are some of the things I can change. You know, once you find someone that you feel you can make a life with. I don't know, I just, I hadn't really listened to those songs back to back, but the approach is very different and um, very hopeful and, and a little raw, where I think bad for business, I'm definitely like the the siren, you know, I'm going to lure them to their doom and generally did, but... <laughs> and their bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> and the near bankruptcy. Yeah, so I mean, that was just something I noticed when I was kind of listening to the song. Both are really beautiful. You've got a song called Big in Japan, like David sure. Hasselhoff is big in Germany and Jerry Lewis was top of the line in France. Is that true? Are you really big in Japan? Huge in Japan. Ooh. <laughs> no, I <laughs> I am. What well, That was really tongue in cheek. You know, obviously, um, big fan of Tom Waits. And that was something. Yeah, I think he had a song, you know, that was big in Japan. And it became the joke because between Clifford and I, there were a lot of things happening in Nashville. There was rock and roll happening in Nashville. There was, you know, obviously there was country. Um, there was some electro stuff starting to happen. And then you'd have this small little pigeonhole and there was jazz. We always thought, you know, this music we were making was really beautiful and gorgeous. You know, it wasn't so much recognized here, but here I was, you know, I was a teacher, you know, I was, I am a special ed teacher. And so I would teach during the day and I would, you know, try to gig, you know, whenever I could at night. And it was interesting because it's like all day, you know, you know, most of the people who came in contact with me never even knew that I sang because I was just paying the bills. And here I was, I had an album out of Japan and it was uh, Young and Naive was picked up. You know, I had top rate billing in the stores, like it was me, Nora Jones and Willie Nelson. I guess they were grouping all the American Texas swing jazz, you know, country jazz stuff. So it was kind of like a little nod to... The fact that I may not be a very big deal here, but, you know, I'm huge. I'm big in Japan, you know. (laughs) Well, we're number three in Singapore. So, (laughs) yeah, we're number three in Singapore, Heather. Oh, nice. So, So we know, we got that going for us, which is nice. (laughs) Tell me about this next song, To Have and To Hold, which is really one of the most gorgeous tunes I've heard in a long time. Well, first off, this is definitely Cliff and Jeff Cohen's Baby. And um, when they brought it in, I immediately loved it because I was actually at a at a point where I, you know, had met someone and we had actually broken up once and we had decided, you know, to kind of go our separate ways. But I kept holding on to the idea of what I thought we could do together and what we could build together. And that's kind of what I feel a lot in this song. And actually, when I was singing it, there were so many emotions just in the little vocal booth for me. And I'm very raw, like I'm very open and I'm very like open to the idea, not just the idea of love anymore, but, you know, open to, okay, I'm ready to knuckle down and do the work and really find someone or make my way back to my now husband who, you know, we, we definitely have done these things. Like, and one thing that was really interesting was uh, fast forward, we were listening to what would be, you know, released on this, you know, album and things like that. And I was pregnant with my, um, my first little girl. I don't know. There's a lot of really good feels in this song for me. And I know it's a favorite. I know a lot of couples have favorited it and, you know, use it in, in their ceremonies, their sacred ceremonies, because it really is just, it, it's a very good representation, I think, of what love is and what love can be. From Heather's album, Young and Naive, to Have and to Hold. It's one thing to have a dream And another to watch it come true To hold out for heaven Then see it every time I look at you talk so obviously but can't you see I'm naturally so in love
I've been a fool, but only a fool would hang on to hope long enough to know there's no letting go to have and to hold you. How could I promise my forever? Till I found the one to come along and read my mind Who I know now I can't live without And begin to doubt I would ever find I can't believe how honestly I've come to be Deliciously so in love. Lo and behold, I've been a fool, but only a fool. Hang on to hope long enough to know there's no. Heather, that's so great. Mm. <laughs> a very Thank different very song much. from uh, Bad for Business. Yes, and, and you know, like I had mentioned earlier, it's, I was in two very different places when yeah. I did the vocal, and I think that's uh, really interesting to kind of, had I done them all like within you know two months or something, I probably would have been in the same state of mind. But having you know, reflecting back on it and the times that we recorded those, it was really just really interesting to kind of remember where I was personally you know, in that spot and how it really translated to the lyric. I could see you, and not many people would I say this to, but I could see you recording some Leonard Cohen song. Oh, thank you. That, I would love, I, I love every bit of him, yes. I got to see him at TPAC probably five years ago, and he was still like a prize fighter. On He came out just punching and, oh, he's so brilliant. Wow. I would love to do anything he has, always <laughs> and forever. It's so interesting. There, there are many, many artists, of course, who admire Leonard Cohen, but only a few, really, that have made an attempt to try to capture some of his depth. And I'm pretty sure you could pull that off. I love him in his early years, but when I saw him, uh, he was singing. He was mainly in his lower register, and when he's singing, "I'm your man," oh my God, like it just. The whole crowd just could feel the gravel, you know, shaking under them. Like it, it's just, he's brilliant. I, and I think I have a little bit of that gravel where I can dig for it yep. <laughs> in my voice. Oh, yes. I think so. Oh, yes. The uh, earthquake meter is rumbling all the time you're singing. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been great. Thank you, George. I appreciate it. Heather's album, Young and Naive, and the 2014 follow-up release, Everything to Me, can be found streaming on Amazon Prime. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by... Angela Roll your special real estate agent for modernist houses and by 
nichiha.com slash usmodernist. Okay, Tom, wrap us up. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 7,500 significant modernist houses, and access 3 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Carrie Cesarino researches guests while juggling two children, a bowling ball, a chainsaw, and dancing the samba with husband Adam very carefully. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I will be back soon with another time-traveling, sunny, breezy, upscale, all-glass edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Mm-hmm.